Okay, so we, uh, where were we last week? Uh, we stopped at uh, page 13, right? Um, <clears throat> on countability and algebra of sets, okay? So there's a new set of uh, notes that has been um, uh, put into Spectrum. You can uh, use that. Uh, so you will see that I will, because the notes get updated uh, every now and then. So uh, if you take, if you observe the, uh, there's a suffix after the file, which I will put something like version 2.1 or something. So this number here indicates the week, right? Where the material is uh, uh, updated. This point one and point two, uh, point one means uh, Tuesday, right? Point two means Thursday, okay? So this just to give you the uh, some idea about the version of the uh, notes, yeah? Okay. Okay, so just to refresh uh, the uh, ideas about countability. So we said something about that, but um, uh, and then we look at some examples, right? So let's look at the concept of countability again. Countability. So you say that a set is countable if uh, its elements can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the values in the set of natural numbers, right? For example, if you have the simplest one is this, right? And so on, right? So if you have the set of natural numbers, uh, which is also one to three, so you have a direct one-to-one uh, -one mapping, right? And therefore, this, this proves countability. Uh, in some other cases, the way you actually uh, map uh, is important, right? So, so uh, we'll look at some more examples. Okay, so one example is the uh, set of rational numbers. So um, actually, it is good to make a construction of uh, the set of rational numbers as, as follows. You can have um, something like this. So you, okay, you, you construct a table and you just list down the numbers here, right? The natural numbers. Okay, so for each cell, so basically, so this cell will represent um, uh, the, the rational number one over one. So this will be one over two, one over three, one over four, one over five, one over six, okay? And here, this will be two over one, two over two, two over three, two over four, over five, two over six, and so on, yeah? So this is three over one, four over one, five over one, six over one, um, three over 
number two. So I'm just going to list down all of these um, values. Okay, so it doesn't end, right? Okay. Now, um, how can you do a one-to-one -one mapping for this kind of numbers? So the idea is to start, um, is to go something like this. You start from here. Uh, so, so one, you will map here. For two, you will go here, right? And then for three, you go like this. Uh, you come like this, then you come down. You go up like this. Move, come down. Okay. Move out like this. Alright. Okay. So if you move like this, you will get your one-to-one -one mapping. So for example, this mapping will be F1, you will map to one over one. F2, you will map to one over two. F3, uh, so sorry, uh, one, two, three. So F3, you will map to two over one. F4, you will map to three over one. F5, you will map to two over two, right? You basically follow this, this uh, path, okay? So, so basically, uh, you can have a one-to-one -one mapping whereby uh, all the elements in the set of rational numbers have a correspondence to the uh, set of natural numbers. Okay, this is uh, this this method. I think it's called uh, the, the diagonalization method. Okay. If not mistaken, uh, it's it was uh, it was actually given by George Cantor. Cantor was a mathematician who uh, did a lot of work in set theory, and I think one of the the interesting part that he did about set theory was that he he uh, showed that. Um, there are many different kinds of uh, infinity. Right? There are certain sets. There are, you, you have infinite sets, right? But he showed that certain infinite sets are, sets are actually larger than certain infinite sets. So he, he kind of like did some work. But that's um, just some, some trivia, okay? All right, okay. So uh, are you able to understand this part, the diagonalization? Method. Yes, get there. Anyone, anyone has problem with this? Okay, so I think uh, you should be okay with this, yeah? All right, okay, uh, then let me clear this. Okay, and then uh, now I want to move on to um, uh, theorem, theorem 3.2.1, which claims that uh, the set of open interval 0, 1 is uncountable. So this basically is the, it's just a real line from zero, running from zero to one. Um, and he 
we I claim that it's uncountable. Okay. So in in fact, in general, the implication from this theorem is that uh, all continuous intervals are uncountable. Okay. You just need to establish this uh, interval, uh, this the uncountability of this uh, uh, set, and the others will follow. Okay. So uh, here we briefly look at the proof. It's like uh, because the proof actually illustrates some interesting way of thinking about uh, a problem. Okay, so um, so in order to prove this statement, if, if you want to establish that uh, E is uncountable, um, here we will establish this fact by, by contradiction, right? So proof by contradiction. Sometimes uh, you can prove something by construction, right? Um, you just uh, start from certain axioms or premises and then you you uh, develop the logical consequence of those axioms okay um, but sometimes uh, that is not uh, possible or very hard to do right so another uh, way to do it is proof by contradiction this is when your outcome right um, the fact that you propose uh, has only two possibilities if it has multiple possibilities, uh, it's a little bit difficult. But if you have only two possibilities, that means uh, you can use contradiction very effectively, right? You just need to show that it is not the other, okay? Uh, then you can, if it's not A, then it's B, right? So they, 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 uh, you, you contradict the other statement and then you, you will be able to uh, prove whatever you want, right? Because it's the remaining one. Okay, uh, so let's see. So, so the idea here is that if you want to use proof by contradiction, you will have to assume that uh, it's countable. Okay, you assume that it's countable, and then you want to derive something that is uh, nonsense. You want to show that by assuming that it's countable, and you you. Uh, develop its properties based on that assumption, you end up with something that's absurd or doesn't make sense. Okay, uh, then that means uh, your assumption was wrong, all right, and therefore the converse is true. So, so we will, so to do that, we assume that it's countable, and if it's countable, uh, that means you will have some one to one mapping, right, such that uh, uh, some function f such that it will map to some particular uh, value in the uh, zero one interval. So these are kept general, yeah? So it's just some, some value like this. Okay, so basically you have this open interval, right? Uh, open interval zero one. Uh, basically, it's just saying that um, so you have the set of natural numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, right? So if you assume that it's countable, that means there's some kind of uh, inti some kind of values from zero to one that you can put to one. Uh, maybe this is two, maybe three is somewhere around here. All right, doesn't matter, and so on and so forth, right? So you're just saying that. Okay, assuming that it's countable, then you should have something like this. Okay, um, we, we don't specify what is uh, what are these values, right? Just a form, all right? Now, when you make this construction, right? Um, uh, it is mentioned that uh, your alpha ij, um, it, it does not in in nine, okay, uh, and not one of these expansions and in nine, sorry, uh, this can be nine, right, so it can be anything, it can be one, two, three, can be zero, 
uh, it can also be zero, right? It can be nine. But uh, it will keep on going, right? It, it does not end. So the ending here is not nine. It, it is something else. It's not nine. Okay. Right, so this alpha one one alpha one two can be any number from zero to nine, right? But it this expansion here doesn't end in nine, okay? Okay, then, okay, is it so far so good? Yes, doctor. Okay. Um. So once you have this construction. Um, okay, so now you consider another value x, right? Just now, so we got all these uh, values 0 to 1, and we, we, we have some kind of mapping like this, right? Okay. okay, and all these mappings, they follow this form, okay? Now, suppose you have another value x, uh, is given by this extension. Okay, zero point, beta one, beta two, and so on. These are just some numbers. Now, you note this numbers, uh, it says uh, your BK is equal to uh, the following. It's equal to AKK plus one, if your AKK is below five. And AKK minus one, if a k k more than five. All right. So so basically, it's it is saying that okay, you look at this. So so these are the diagonals. You if you look at this carefully. So for all this mapping, you have a diagonal here, right? So alpha one one, alpha two two, alpha three three, and so on, right? So it's, it's a diagonal. Now it's saying that you you have another number in this interval where it has this uh, decimals, right? And its values here, right? Your position beta one, beta two, they they will differ from your uh, they will differ from previously assigned uh, numbers like this. Okay, you can you can make it uh, different by specifying some rule like this. Uh, this is not a unique rule, okay? It's just a rule that works. So if the, uh, for, for example, over here, if this a, uh, alpha one one is uh, less than or equals to five, you will just add one to it. You just take it and then you add one to it. Okay? And if it's more than five, you will just uh, subtract one for it. Maybe, maybe some, I'll just, Write down an example. Okay, these are some examples, yeah? So you look at, this is your alpha one one, alpha two two, alpha three three, okay? It is saying that when you do this construction, right? This uh, X, right? You will construct it as this, okay? So this is five, right? Okay, well, this is five. So uh, your alpha one, A one one, oh, sorry, this, I just use alpha. Okay, I think in the notes I I should use alpha. Yeah? I uh, I mistyped it. Okay, anyway, so so this should be zero point. So this is uh, alpha one one plus one, right? Since your alpha one one is uh, five, right? So you will put six here, right? Your five plus one, you get six. Okay, and then for this one in the second position, be uh, beta two. Uh, this is six, right? Okay, your alpha two two is six. Okay, so it should follow here. It should it should go here. 
Um, and then you take six and subtract one, so you get five, right? And then the next one, you have three, right? So three, you should fall here under this situation. Uh, alpha three, three is uh, three. So you add one, so it becomes four, right? So you see that um, it will definitely, when you make this construction, right, this number can never be equal to F1, F2, F3. It can never be because it will surely uh, be different in at least one position. Okay, can you see that? Like, for example, because you, you force its uh, decimal expansion here to be different from uh, all the previous ones, okay? By adding one or subtracting one, depending on what was the previous number, okay, uh, on the uh, alpha KK. So this X can never be any of this F1, F2, F3, can never be, all right? Okay, now, if you make this construction, uh, this also contains no zero, uh, contains no nine. All right, so it will contain no nine as well. All right, let me make some space here. Okay, uh, so, so since it contains no nine, right, it should be also mappable to, uh, according to this function, because these functions, they never end in a uh, nine, okay? So you will have uh, some j in n, such that your fj is equal to x, right? So there will be, some particular, uh, so it won't be one, two, three, but it will be some other value in N, okay? Uh, which implies that uh, zero point alpha J1, alpha J2 will be equal to zero point beta one, beta two. Okay? However, uh, when you have this equality here, uh, the term here, right, alpha, uh, uh, this will be, uh, okay, I think it should be a J. I, I think in the notation I use a K, but actually it should be a J, yeah? So you, you move long enough, so this will be alpha, there will be some position alpha JJ that is matching with beta J, all right? All right, and then uh, your beta j, right? Okay, see, it follows this rule. So it will be either, it will be equal to alpha jj plus minus one, right? It's either plus one or minus one. Okay, but then your, this beta j is matching with uh, alpha JJ, right? So this is implying that, let me make some space here. Okay, so it implies that your, um, so you have, uh, okay, you have beta J equals to alpha JJ plus minus one, which is here. But uh, its position is also matching here. So it'll be also equal to alpha JJ. Okay, and this implies that, uh, so this implies that this, this uh, so this will cancel. So it implies that zero is equal to plus minus one, which cannot be true, right? Is is uh, uh, is uh, nonsense. Okay, so this is how you derive the, the contradiction, all right? Um, okay, so, so can I get some feedback from you? Okay, whether you understand this, this uh, argument.
Yes, doctor. Okay, so um, you can actually uh, read the proof again. Uh, I'll update the uh, notation just to fix a few of the notations, right? Okay, actually, actually the proof is just to uh, let you be aware of um, how we argue about uh, such things, okay? In practice, uh, for application-wise, uh, we, we will just uh, use the result uh, that the uh, set of open interval is uncountable, okay? Uh, of course, the set of, uh, once the set of open interval is uncountable, the set of closed interval is def definitely uncountable. Um, can somebody just quickly argue why this is so? So we know that E equals to this is uncountable. Uh, this implies that E equals to uh, 0, 1, this is close, is also uncountable. Can anyone quickly point out why this is true? Um, because the closed bracket E, uh, the, the open bracket E is the subset of uh, the closed bracket E. So since the open bracket 0 to 1 is uncountable, that means that the closed bracket 0 to 1 is also uncountable? Uh, subset, what do you mean? Uh, the closed set is actually larger than the open set. So if the smaller yeah, set is uncountable, so you're saying if the smaller set is uncountable, then the larger set is also uncountable. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically what, uh, uh, what was uh, said just now was, um, Yujing, right? One. One Yujing, okay. So what was said was just now was that this is actually equal to uh, the union of zero, one with, sorry, um, let me see, just erase this, this uh, union, the, these two values. Okay, agree? So, so basically, this is your set. You add two points here, zero and one. You will get the closed set, okay? So this is definitely, uh, uh, therefore, this set is actually smaller than this set, right? So if the smaller set is uncountable, uh, the larger set is definitely uncountable, okay? It's just like, um, you remember, if you do convergence, right? If the if you have two sets, sorry, if, if you have um, uh, let me see, what's an what's a good example? Um, okay, that that may involve some sequence of numbers. Uh, maybe we 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 talk about that later. But but generally is, uh, is understood that uh, your larger for un for something that, that uh, so you have a larger set containing something that's smaller. If the smaller already uh, is not countable or if it does not converge, right? And then your, the larger set will also not uh, 
converge, right? It, it will be constrained by the property of the smaller set. Okay. Okay, that's why uh, uh, you only need to establish this fact and then the others will follow. Okay. Right, okay. So uh, that's why in theorem 3.2.2, um, we have countability of sets of real numbers. Okay, uh, these are just two results, okay? Um, basically, uh, that was what was said, right? If A is a subset of, is subset or equal to B and A is uncountable, then B is uncountable, right? This is exactly um, the result uh, applied to this case, okay? Um, and then uh, the set of real numbers is uncountable, all right? So this is also easy to prove, right? R is uncountable. Um, it just follows from um, the second statement, right? That uh, you can easily show that uh, 0, 1 is inside uh, R, okay? So 0, 1 uncountable implies that R is uncountable, okay? Very simple. Right. Okay, so uh, we do one more example before we take a uh, 10 minute break. Uh, you can do some stretch, you should do some stretching to relieve yourself of uh, the, the kind of discomfort that you get from sitting too long in front of a computer. I definitely need that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you have De Morgan's law. So you may have uh, recalled this from some year one mathematics. So this will be uh, uh, important later when we study uh, probability theory, right? We will use some uh, results from De Morgan's law. Okay, but uh, just briefly is that uh, if you have some sets A1, A2, okay, uh, collection of subsets, right? Doesn't matter what, what these sets are. Then if you take the collection here, you take their union, right? You take the union, you complement them, it will be equal to, uh, operationally, it's very easy to remember. You just need to uh, kind of like flip this from union, you flip to intersection, and then you'll bring the complement symbol inside. Okay, operationally, right? Of course, uh, we that, that, that has to be a proof to it, right? It, you can't just move things like this uh, because there are a thousand ways to move things differently, okay? So they must actually have some basis. But it, it's nice that uh, the operations are easy to remember. And then uh, if you have uh, intersection, okay, uh, just, for, just for those, for the convenience of those who may not be used to this notation, this means that you have A1 union, A2 union, A3, and so on until union A N. Okay, uh, it's just a shorthand for for multiple unions and and same for the big uh, N here. So basically, if you have uh, this thing here, uh, it's the same. You reverse. Okay, and you bring the complement inside, right? The proof is actually quite simple. Uh, you just need to prove part one and part two uh, will follow by operation of the, by using um, the result in part one. So very quickly here, um, uh, you have, the proof is as, 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 is as follows. So if you have uh, for, okay, so I want to prove this statement. Okay, 
So I'll say that for some x in so this will be my my non-empty set x. Uh, basically, you have some x here, and this these are your a one a twos. Okay, these are collections of uh, sets, right? Okay, so. So uh, for some value, uh, so so okay. So this this one, um, so you have x not in the union. Okay, so union of a y will be something like this, right? You take these guys, you you kind of like join them together, right? So okay, only these guys. So, so uh, since this is a complement, um, you will basically you'll have, so, so this set, so the elements in this set will indicate these points, right? They are not inside this set, right? X, therefore you have X not inside here, yeah? Okay, X not inside here. And this implies that your X is inside AI complement. Um, for all I one two, and okay. So since your so for any points sitting here, so it will be outside of uh, uh, this union, right? And therefore, it's inside the complements, right? AI complement will be outside of AI, right? Somewhere around there. Is simultaneously outside of uh, all of them, right? So this implies that your x is inside um, Okay Okay, it's in, in all the AIs at the same time, so it's inside their intersection Okay, so this, this uh, proves the first statement here Okay, to prove the second statement, you just need to uh, uh, to apply this result. Uh, so, for example, so this if this is true, then this is also true. Okay, so instead, so you can uh, instead of considering uh, AI, you can also consider its complement, right? It it will also be true. Okay, and then uh, you apply this result, right? Okay, so let me see. So it will be true for, so if you replace your AI with AI complement, right? So then you will you, you'll be equal to this part, right? Okay, and uh, so what will we get? So over here, let me show you something first. Okay, so this will be uh, true. Okay, so over here you will get um, On this side, you will get all right because the the complementation will will undo each other. And over here, you have um, okay. 
so this will be n a let me see um Uh, and AI C, this will be something like this. Um, wait. So we want to show, okay, we want to show, um, is equal to this. Okay, so we're gonna start with with uh, the, the this this first result, yeah. Um. Okay, so this will be true. Okay, so basically you are replacing your AI with, with AIC here, right? AIC here. Okay, so basically this is the same. Uh, after that, you, you, you basically just uh, complement both sides. You complement both sides, yeah? Okay. So if you complement both sides, uh, what happens is that this this two complementation operations will uh, will disappear, and here you will get an A I C. Okay, and uh, here you will get U A I C. Okay. All right, so uh, in the notes, uh, I, I wrote uh, the right hand side on the left, all right, but it's the same. Okay, so the idea is just very simple. Replace your AI with your AIC, and then, uh, so you, you get this part, and then you complement both sides, right? Uh, by doing so, uh, if the complementation operation appears two times, you cancel that. And then you will get uh, result number two. All right. Okay. Uh, this is just to convince you that the operations have a basis. All right. Uh, for actual uh, usage later, we will basically just uh, use these two results. All right. Uh, repeatedly. Okay. Uh, all right. So we will take a ten-minute uh, break now and come back at um, uh, 12.02 yeah all right okay so now we are moving on to uh, 
uh, section 3.3, functions of sets. Okay, I guess uh, most of you have some idea about uh, functions, right? Okay. They're basically just uh, uh, mappings, okay? You take one number and you map it to somewhere else, okay? So here we want to uh, define uh, functions that are operating on uh, sets, right? Certain sets. Okay, so just to refresh you the, def the definition, right? Um, so if you have uh, X and Y as two sets, and then you have some function uh, F, okay? You have some function F that maps X to Y, right? So elements of X are mapped onto Y. Then um, we have the following uh, definitions. So basically uh, the meaning is that you if you have some, uh, so you have, the space y here, this is another space, uh, so a space of x, space of y. So you might have some numbers like this, okay? Um, and so on, doesn't matter, okay? So you can have some kind of a uh, mapping, right? And you can form uh, different sets in the space of x, right? So you can have a set, um, a set that's like this, a set that's like that, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so just for simplicity, let's say we have a set one, two, three in X. So this is this will be my E, which is a subset of X. So I can have a mapping. I take one and I put it, I map it to two in uh, the space Y. I can take two and map it to four, and can take three and map it to six and so on, right? There are many uh, ways to map this, right? So depending on how you want to specify your F. So this F is basically a rule, right? That uh, assigns a number in this space to another number in that space, okay? So we will say that this, these are the images, okay? The image of uh, E under F, okay? So this will be called the image of E under F. If you take for this uh, set E, you take the value one, you put it here in a certain rule, right? Okay. Um, so then we will write uh, F of E is equal to the set of Y, uh, the values of Y in the, in the space the elements of y eh, in the space big Y, such that y is equal to fx for some x in E. Okay? So this is the uh, definition. It based, so if you look at this, it actually makes sense, right? It's just saying that it's some elements of y. So these are elements of y, right? Some elements of y such that your y is equal to f of x for some x in E, right? So in this case here, your fx will be something like 2x, right? Let's do double, right? 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 3 to 6. Uh, but I want to just let you know that this f can in general be uh, any one-to-one -one mapping. It doesn't need to have some formula, right? Uh, you might be mistaken that it has to be have some formula representation. No, it does. It is not required. As long as it has a one-to-one -one mapping, it's fine. You can even verbally describe this relationship, right? It doesn't need to have a formula, okay? Um, although most of the time, if you have certain structures, then of course you will have a formula representation, but uh, otherwise uh, it can be totally general. Uh, then you can talk about the inverse image of E in Y, okay? Uh, so you have F inverse E is defined as the set of uh, the elements of X in big X, such that your FX is equal to Y for some 
y in b. Okay. Now, uh, so here, you okay? You you have to take note of this terms here. It just says for some, yeah. It didn't say all, yeah. Okay. So this this will be important later, right? It just says some, eh? not all. Eh? Now, um, if you have the set one, two, three here, right? Um, you could have something like only one, uh, perhaps in this space, there is only one, two, four, six, and so on. Okay? So here, if your Fe will be equal to uh, two, four, and six, right? So your E is uh, one, two, and three, okay? Following the, this, this particular mapping. Now, if you take F inverse E, all right? Now, look, look very carefully. Uh, your E, right, is basically one, two, three, but in your space Y here, there's only one and two, yeah? Three is missing, all right? So, uh, if you're going to have some kind of mapping, so what will this be? It says the value of x in, in this space such that your f of x is equal to y. So in fact, over here, there will only be um, one, yeah? Okay, because uh, for one, you map to two, right? And two is actually uh, one of the elements here, okay? But uh, for one, there's actually no mapping, all right? So, so when you do the inverse uh, image, it's only one, yeah? The two and three are not there, okay? So let's look at a few more examples uh, to be clear. Um, and, and please take note, yeah, there is, uh, I said there that uh, this F inverse E, uh, a lot of you may actually uh, recall that this might be some kind of inverse function, right? Um, it should not be, in general, it should not be interpreted as uh, an inverse function unless uh, it only has a correspondence to inverse function uh, if your f is one to one. Then uh, you can think of f, uh, uh, the, the inverse mapping as the inverse function. Uh, but there are actually uh, functions that are not one to one, but you can still get the inverse image, right? But uh, if the function is not one to one, you don't actually have a, a, in, an inverse. Okay, so you have to be a bit careful here because you might be used to this notation being the inverse function. Okay, so here it just says that it's an inverse image. Huh? So these are the somewhat uh, slightly different kinds of uh, things that, um, that may actually be a bit different from what you have learned with uh, working with functions in, in uh, real numbers. Okay. okay, let's look at some examples. Okay, that uh, example 3.3.1. So you, you basically have the set here, minus two, minus one, one, and two, right? Um, so basically, and you define your fx to be x plus one, right? So basically, whatever x you have here, you just add one to it, okay? So basically, uh, therefore your fe is basically just uh, all these values, you add one. So Minus two becomes minus one, minus one will be zero, one will be two, and two will be three, right? Very simple. Okay, so if you want a graphical representation, uh, it's just something like this. Uh, minus one, zero, two, three, so you map like this, okay? Right. Uh, for the, okay. For the set, all right, so for the set uh, as follows. Um, so then if you take F inverse E, right? That means you are taking, so, 
So if you have this, if you take the inverse, this should be minus three, minus two, zero, one. Okay, note that your E is this one. Huh? So uh, it should be the set of values in, in uh, X such that when you, uh, uh, such that you can actually map to this set, right? So basically this will be minus three, minus two, zero, one, because when you add one, when you add one, it becomes minus two, you add one, it becomes minus one, add one becomes one, add one becomes two. So basically this is this set, okay? All right, uh, and then I said that uh, if you had considered f inverse as a kind of uh, inverse function, so you can find an inverse function of x easily as uh, x minus one, right? Okay, uh, because in this case, uh, f f inverse is actually uh, x plus one, uh, sorry, uh, x minus one, plus one equals to x, right? So, so that would have worked as well, okay? If you had used uh, f inverse this function and you put in uh, this set of values, you would have obtained this as well, okay? Now let's look at a slightly uh, different example. Okay, so if you consider a many to one mapping f, like a square, a uh, uh, quadratic function, right? Okay, so if you have f of e, so again, your e is, uh, just to write it out. So your f of e is equal to one and four, right? Because uh, your, your minus two will map to, four, right, after you square. This will also map to four, and this will map to one, this will map to one, right? So your f of e is just uh, one and four. Um, and then how about f of inverse e? Okay, I claim that this is equal to minus square root of two, minus one, one, and square root of two. The reason is if um, if you take the square, right? For these values, if you square it, you will end up with two here. You end up with uh, one. Sorry. Um, Okay, so, so these are in Y, so this is one. Um, let me see. Uh, maybe better to do a sketch. So this is your function x squared. Okay, so I have, um, suppose I have minus two, minus one, one and two here, okay? So they map, so your Fe will be very simple. So you take minus one, you map to one, right? One will also map to one, okay? And your two 
or map to four here. Okay, your minus two will map to four, uh, and this will also map to sorry, something like this four. Okay. All right, that's uh, straightforward. Now, um, if you consider uh, minus two, okay, so now you're considering, uh, so this is on your x, this is on your y. So now you are taking this, right, but your y actually is actually starting from zero and onwards, right? It, it doesn't have uh, this, but you, you can put it like this, minus two, minus one, uh, one here, and two here, right? Okay. So now from y, right, you want to map, you want to take the inverse image, right, for the same. So you can see that minus two, minus one, one and two uh, is running here. Okay, that's from x going to uh, y. But if you are coming for the same set of values, right, e, if you start from y and want to go to x, then you have to look at this part here, right? So, so then there's actually no, uh, no mapping for minus one and minus two, because if you move here, it doesn't touch any of the fx uh, lines there. Only you have it for one and two, right? So you move out, and then you map back to x, right? Move out, map back to x. Okay, so from two, this part will will map to square root of 2, this part will map to minus square root of 2, here will be minus 1 and here will be 1, right? That's why you have uh, f inverse of e is minus square root of 2, minus 1, 1 and square root of 2. Okay, uh, this will not work if you try to use the inverse function uh, method, uh, it just breaks down. Okay, so uh, that's why I, I, I suggest that you um, work on this uh, as a, a something like a slightly different concept, right? Uh, use a diagram to help you, okay? Uh, once you have the diagram, uh, it will be easy. So your f of e is basically from the x axis to the y. That will be very simple as long as you can sketch uh, the function. And then for uh, f inverse of e is basically you take whatever set e here, you flip it onto your uh, y axis, and then you'll start to uh, map back to your x, okay? So let's look at a few more examples, yeah? Uh, after a couple of examples, you will find that this is actually quite uh, easy to work with. Okay, um, let me clear this. Okay, then I have example 3.3.2. Your E is uh, minus one five, okay? So my function is uh, x squared, okay? So basically uh, I have, again I sketch this. Okay, so this is my x squared. Um, I'm okay, so I'm doing something like this. Minus one is here, and my five is here. Okay, so I dig here, and okay, so I have something like this, right? So you start from here and you end up here, right? So your FE is clearly so your one minus one you will map to one, right? Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, it will map to one, right? Uh, but but zero will map to zero. Okay, so this will map to twenty-five. Okay, so the the interval of uh, the values that you get for the mapping starts from here. Eh? It starts from zero. Because your one actually is not starting from the smallest value, yeah. The smallest value you get uh, is uh, when you map zero, okay, to zero to zero. So you therefore that's why you over here you have zero to twenty-five, okay. You note the uh, inclusion there, eh? okay. All right, is that clear? So uh, 
because your minus one, right, they map here, but your zero will map to something that is actually uh, smaller. So your interval is running from zero to 25. And it's inclusive, yeah, because uh, your zero is included in this interval. And then how about F inverse E, right? Okay, so for F inverse E, I will look at, again, this is minus one to five, right? So I will flip. So we've got minus one, two, five. Okay, my minus one not included. Now, so I don't have the border with mapping these values here because they, they don't map to any part. They, they, they don't have a function for them, right? So only I start from uh, here, zero, which is zero. And then any values from uh, here, I would map to this part and so on and so forth, right? To both wings, okay? And so on, right? So uh, at most I map to here, okay? So, yeah. Um, Fe, isn't it should be a union? with the, I mean, not inclusive one. I mean like zero to one, but not inclusive one. And then one to 25. It, it includes one because uh, you see your one, because okay, minus one, uh, minus one maps to one, but your one also maps to one. Oh, okay, okay, I see. All right, yeah, thank you. Your one also maps to one, so so uh, this is okay. 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 Uh, okay. So for your FE, so so you will map like this, right? For so the so this one will you will map like this, right? Now, so your that's that's why you will find that uh, once it maps like this, it will run from minus. Uh, you run from my uh, minus sorry minus square root of five okay to square root of five All right because you cover the entire uh, uh, range here okay so um, so the way to do this is actually uh, just just to recap. So you, for, for this mapping is usually easy to do, right? So you just have you have specified a function, um, then you see what interval you are working with, and then you map to the y, right? For the inverse image, you take the same because you are working with the same set, right? So basically, it's like you rotate, right? You rotate and put it on the y axis, and then you start mapping back to and your x, and then you watch the interval. All right, so so that's the uh, way to work with your uh, inverse uh, image. Um, so I give you example three point three point three. So that should be um, self-explanatory. All right. So I actually have a sketch there of uh, log of x. Okay, so you, you basically sketch that function and then you have a mapping from um, the set E is one to two, right? So not including one. So that will map to, FE will be very simple. We'll just map to zero and uh, log of two, right? Inclusive of log two. Okay, uh, let me just clear this. So uh, you will get some practice later in the tutorials, yeah, uh, for doing inverse um, inverse images for under different kinds of mappings. Um, okay, so this one is basically so your log function. Okay, is something like this. Log x, right. So basically I map, um, so my e is from one to two. So one is here. 
Okay, so this is my one, but not including, right? So it will map to, uh, oh, sorry, it, this should be two. We'll see if one is, one is here, okay. Uh, maps to zero. Okay, the two will map to log of two. Right, that's very easy. Um, so then if you have uh, the same interval, but so, so this is from X to Y, right? So you, for the same interval, you move from uh, Y to X, right? So your one will be uh, here and your two will be here. Uh, sorry, no. Um, log two is, is zero point. Uh, sorry, six. I was away for a second. Uh, what is this function? It's a log function. All right, thank you. Yeah, so log two is zero point six nine something. So your one uh, and two will be here. One will be here, and your two will be here. Okay. So then, therefore, you map back, like, right? oops. Um, okay, so you map back like this. Okay. So, what value of uh, x when you take log will give you one? So that's obviously e. Okay, this this is a here, when I write log, it means ln, yeah? Uh, only if I put 10, that means log base 10. Otherwise, in general, when we write log, it means ln. They are the same thing, okay? Uh, so here, this will be e squared, right? So therefore, your f e is uh, 0 log 2. And your F inverse E is uh, E E square. Okay. Um, if you want to work with the inverse function, that's also fine. You will get the same answer here because um, your log function is uh, one to one. Okay. But in general, try not to use the inverse function because um, the function that you work with may not always be one to one. Okay, is this example? Are the examples clear? Yes. Okay. Um, then I just want to uh, talk about theorem three point three point one, and then we can um, have a break. Uh, we can call it a day for, for the course. Uh, this is algebra of functions of sets. Um, so basically, you can perform some kind of uh, algebra with, with uh, this kind of uh, functions of sets. Okay, so you have, this, you have uh, results like this. Um, you have union. <clears throat> so this is a set, right? This is some kind of set, okay? Uh, that's uh, built from uh, taking the union of multiple sets. So, so, so basically this is just some set, right? I, I can just say that this is some E, right? So uh, therefore you, uh, you have a function that maps E, okay? So this can be written as U of F A I. It's as if your F can swap position with the union, okay? And this is a useful uh, property, All right? The, uh, it's like if you map elements in, in this uh, set, it's the same as uh, the union of uh, individual mappings, okay? In the individual sets. And if you have f of the intersection of AI, 
Now this one you don't actually have some kind of uh, equality, but you have a set relationship, right? Remember these are still sets, right? This is a mapping. So it will produce a set. Uh, and this set is actually nested in the intersection of, uh, okay? So meaning that uh, the, the function of the intersection of A1 is actually smaller than or equals to the intersection of the uh, individual functions of the sets, okay? And this results later will become very useful, okay? Uh, and uh, there are some other results, uh, part two and uh, result two, uh, not that important, I just put it there for completeness sake. And uh, then the other one is the inverse, dealing with the inverse. So you have inverse of u ai. Now this one is important later when you talk about random variables. Um, when we try to understand what exactly are random variables. Uh, the inverse image of this set is the same as the union of um, the inverse image of uh, A1 until An, okay? And for intersection, you have an exact result. The inverse image of the intersection is the intersection of the inverse images, right? Again, uh, it's very easy to uh, remember as, and use uh, because it's like you can just basically swap the uh, position of the um, function and also the set operation. Of course, uh, this swapping is, is, uh, has a theoretical basis, right? It's, it, that's a proof for it, um, but we will not go through that, yeah? Uh, it's rather abstract, okay? But uh, it's nice to know that uh, it, it actually works. Okay, and then uh, parts four and five, I'll uh, just put that for completeness, yeah? Okay, so the more important results are one and three. All right. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about uh, for today. So we, we um, will cover sequences in uh, the set of real numbers on, thurs on Thursday. Yeah? Um, sir? Yes. Can you just go back to example number four where you did the log X to find the image? Uh, for zero, it wasn't inclusive. Why is that? Uh, the image was from zero to log two. Uh, is it example 3.3.3? .3 I think so, the one with log x, yeah. Log x, okay. So your function is uh, your y. So log x goes like this, right? Uh, for x equals to one, you have zero and a uh, lock of uh, a value between zero and one, you have a negative, okay? So okay. my set is E of one, two. So I want to do F of E, right? Um, so basically, so my one here, so, okay, so, so I should put a op open circle like this. So one will map here, okay? So I should put an open circle here. So this will basically be zero, right? Right? One will map here, and then your two will map here. And this will be log of two, log. right? Yeah. So that's why this will be zero and log two. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, I just, uh, why is the zero not inclusive when you, when you do that? Well, it's not inclusive because, uh, it, well, one is not included. Okay. It's, op it's open here, right? 
All right. And yeah. for the inverse, it's going to be uh, exponential to e to e squared. Right. Right. So uh, again, because it's one and two, so log two is zero point six nine something. So your one will be here, and your oh, two and the will, one is not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I got it. So so you will map like this. So maybe I use a red line here. So it will, it will go back like this, but here it will map to. Not gonna be inclusive. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be E, right? Because okay. uh, a lot of E, you'll get one. And this will be E squared. Okay. So that's why your your uh, F inverse of E will be uh, e, e squared. Not including E because, uh, yeah. The one is not included. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's, it's open. So, so okay. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I think problems with mappings, uh, mapping inverse images, um, they become easy to handle if you can sketch the function. Um, well, of course, uh, over here we will just deal with uh, functions that, I mean, like not some any arbitrary functions. So arbitrary functions will be a bit um, harder to handle. But generally, uh, so well for well-defined functions, um, you once you sketch the graph, you should be able to uh, see it clearly. Oh, you don't worry. Uh, don't worry. You in the tutorials, you'll get some practice for that. Okay. Um, so. Any more questions from you? Have any more queries? Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, uh, let's stop here for today. Um, please remember to sign your attendance in Spectrum, yeah? Okay, thank you, Doctor. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone. So I'm going to uh, end the meeting now.